afternoon once again, and we thank you for joining us in the last segment for this afternoon on our conference for the state governorship election. We kicked off at about uh, 8 or there about this morning, giving you up to the minute update on what is going on in Undo State. So far, so good. There hasn't been any report of violence, vote buying, snatching of ballot box. What we have seen, they've all been in the positive direction. And we hope that it stays that way up to the time that the results of the election is announced, or, or even after that time. And uh, I want to commend uh, all the stakeholders involved in this election in what they've done so far. But particularly, the electorates have defied every odds to come out there to cast their vote. A major sad point would have been the votes that uh, capsized at the Cerdo with electoral materials floating on the sea. But Aine came out to say no life was lost. All those involved, the adult staff, were adequately rescued. But they hope to give an official statement on that tomorrow. I want to say big thanks to our panelists that are here in the studio. Christopher Ojekere has been with us since morning. Chris, thanks again for coming. Yeah, thank you, Sonny. We also have with us here the erudite Professor Benson Osadolo. Reverend Professor Benson Osadolo is uh, currently with uh, the Benin United Baptist Mission. Reverend, thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you so much. My pleasure to be here. We also have with us Professor Anthony Ikori, a senior lecturer, Professor of Business Administration from Maduna University. Prof, again, thank you for joining the studio. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay. Uh, let me begin with uh, Professor Benson Osadolo. Uh, this election has some very unique features, just the same way it was with the Edo State <coughs> governorship election. But literally, Edo State handed over the baton to Undo State. What's your take on what you've observed so far, what you've heard so far, against the background of the seemingly untoward activities that preceded this election? Well, um, we put it two ways. Uh, the electoral process itself is complex with a variety of activities. And um, if you take a do and you want to use it as the basis of looking at Ondo, oh, the pre-election period, the election now and post-election, I think uh, we may be making a, a little bit of mistake. Uh, a do is quite unique on its own in terms of what happened uh, on or before the 19th of uh, September. And today, the 10th day of October 2020, and I think the Ondo case is different. Uh, let's not look at one aspect, the security aspect of the election. Uh, because before the election, uh, the people thought that maybe Ondo was at war for so many reasons. If you recall, when the campaign team of uh, the PDP candidates was at uh, Akoko West, uh, for, uh, 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 apparently to pay homage to the Oloba of Oba Akoko. It was there that there was some kind of violence. Uh, some claim that the governor's convoy that was passing by was the one that attacked the PDP convoy that was paying homage to the Oba. But if that, that didn't just end there, if you also recall, on the major road leading out of Ondo to Ore, a huge truck, you know, was used to block the road yes. to deny the Zenith Labour Party candidate from access from Ondo to go to Ore for the flag of, of his campaign. Okay, take the case of what happened in Owa, where it is considered to be the stronghold of the equipment governor and the PDP candidate was attacked there during this campaign. So all of this created an impression that maybe Ondo was poised for war, unlike in the case of uh, those states. Uh, today, the report so far, from what we have gathered from the media, is that the election has been peaceful. Uh, it is not what was anticipated, that the heat up, the tension to Today's election in Ondo may be something else, but the people have given it a completely different interpretation. Now look, this may have happened while we were campaigning, but today, 
we want to have a credible and uh, free, fair election. But on the part of IMEC, if you look at what happened in Edo State, uh, in the case of Edo State, I find something very interesting. INEC was able to inspire the confidence and trust that they are ready to, con to conduct elections that will be credible and acceptable to the people of Edo State. The same way INEC has said, has inspired that same confidence, that same trust on the people of Edo State that, look, we are here not to take side with anybody, but to ensure that we conduct elections that will be free and fair, credible, transparent, as well as peaceful. So that is what we have seen so far, that ANEC is playing its role as an umpire in the organization of the election today in other states. But in addition to that, in the case of all those, uh, at, at those states, we also notice that the materials were there on time, elections started on time, there were pockets of candidates not functioning properly, and so on and so forth. But although the report so far has not indicated anything different, that ANEC got itself prepared for this tax for today, mm -hmm. learning from the Edo September 19 experience okay. to ensure that at least the hiccups that we notice in Edo State will not repeat itself in Ondo State. And it's commendable on the part of ANEC. All right, let's just take a look at uh, what's uh, coming in from Ondo 2020. Kingsley Uchebu reports that aggrieved voters engaged in verbal exchange amidst malfunctioning of electronic card readers in Unit 22, which uh, Professor Benson Sadolo mentioned a while ago. Uh, Unit 22, Ward 10 in Ore, where voters were subjected to using two electronic card. All right, but should that really be an issue? The most important thing is that they were accredited and allowed to vote. But let's see if we can uh, get, get you, uh, if we can, we can get you to listen to this video. Of course, uh, King Luchegbu bringing us a uh, live update there in Unit 22, Ward 10 in Ore, where voters were subjected to using two electronic cards. Uh, that shouldn't really be any problem, Prof, because uh, no, no, no. If, if one of the card reader fails, another is brought in to salvage the situation, why should that be a problem? It should not be a problem, because don't forget, just before election, I think lost most of the card readers oh, yes. in an inferno. Mm. There was a fire outbreak, a mysterious fire outbreak that mm. destroyed those card readers. And so what ANEC did was to make provision for new card readers. Which they promised. Which they promised yeah. to do, and yeah. I'm sure they have done that. But if one card reader is not functioning properly, because I'm sure they didn't go through tests, they could use another card reader. There's no problem with that. But the most important thing is that it's the franchise. That's the most important thing about this election. The right to vote, to not be denied to the people of Ondo State because a card reader is malfunctioning. That's my position. And I think that position is what every other person should also uh, accept. There are incidents from that can be completed mm. in the event of a card reader not being able to identify or verify the true identity of the card owner. If that happens, then of course it's clear the election is going on freely. Okay. All right, let's just uh, keep you up to speed some of the stories on some of our national dailies on Odo 2020. Hashtag Odo 2020 from this day uh, is this report that there's a bit of chaos and unruly behavior at Arugbo Ward 1, Unit 6. The youths refused to be persuaded to allow the elderly pregnant women and nursing mothers the privilege to vote first. All right, so that's... Um, what's happening there from this day. And then there's this other story also from this day. Uh, we heard about this a while ago, but we really couldn't confirm it independently. It says, um, pandemonium in short and ensued in Akure, Ondo State Capital, when gun-wielding men invaded a poly unit, shooting sporadically mm -hmm. to disperse the voting process. The incident occurred at Unit 4, Ward 4, Ijomu Obanla in Akure North, Akure South local government area at about 8.40 a.m. 
During the incident, a young man who was identified simply as a boyega was allegedly shot and was rushed to the hospital on a motorcycle. Prospective voters, media men, election observers, and INEC officials scampered for safety as the hoodlums continued shooting for several minutes. Operatives of the Federal Road Safety Corps, who were nearby Ijomu Junction, also ran for cover. The situation was later brought under control by men of the Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corps. An eyewitness who gave his name as Tokbe claimed that the thugs are members of one of the two main political parties. Uh, he says, and I quote, they came here in their vehicle with guns and started shooting as soon as they came out. One of them went straight to the boy, Boyoga, and shot him at close range. The hoodlums are here with us. We know them and the people who sent them. One of them was among those who shot people down the street last week. So uh, that's a report from this day. We've not been able to independently confirm that report. And then again, there's a story that there was a boat carrying electoral materials and other staff to the Independent National Electoral Commission River areas of Ilaje local government area in ongoing Undo State governorship election that capsized. The wooden boat reportedly, uh, I'm sure Chris will be interested in this story because <laughs> we talked about this extensively exactly. uh, earlier. It says the wooden boat reportedly carrying no fewer than 15 persons mm. capsized owing mm. to overloading mm. with personnel and some election materials apart from strong wave and the current. Some of the other staff were seen in videos of the incident swimming to safety or to join other boats on the mission. Local divers nearby were said to have made efforts to rescue the victims. Confirming the incident, Mr. Rutimi Oyekomi, the Chief Press Secretary to the INEC Chairman, Professor Mahmoud Yakub, said that a statement will be issued on this in Akure in due course. He, however, said that the Commission got report that there was no casualty as all the victims were rescued. All right, so that's uh, on the um, wooden boat that capsized. We need to stress that point to the wooden boat. Yeah, of course, uh, incumbent governor and the APC governorship candidate wrote to me Akero Dolu and his wife voting at Unit 6, what, 5, Ijebu uh, That's the picture there, all right? And uh, that's him again and his wife. And then, of course, uh, him again and his wife. And then uh, we, uh, we told you about the mishap. And then there was a story that was also trending, which uh, this day has also captured here. Uh, ZLP candidate Abuola Alfred Ajayi in his country home in uh, Kiribo in a uh, the local government area denied rumors that he stepped down from the Ondo State governorship contest. Yeah, journalists went to his house and interviewed him. And then, of course, uh, across the state, voting is on the, on the way. Uh, no social distancing. We talked about that before. And then uh, voters uh, wearing face masks amidst the tight security, all right? And um, the situation has been quite interesting, relatively peaceful, so far so good. Uh, Professor Anthony Jewelry, let, let me get your take on uh, some of the feedback that is coming in from the conduct of the election so far. Well, uh, I think, uh, like my colleague said, uh, Professor Sadol, I think INEC has uh, tried to improve on the shortfall of uh, the state uh, election. And uh, we, because reports so far has been positive, uh, in spite of some of the negatives we are hearing recently, the shooting in Nakure and uh, some uh, hoodlums tried to disrupt the election. But uh, in terms of uh, the synergy between INEC and uh, police or security agents, I think uh, they've been uh, doing their, their best, especially when we consider what happened uh, in a do state, I think there's some level of uh, improvement. Uh, but all the same, we expect that uh, Anna could have done better in terms of the card reader by ensuring that they provide workable card readers. You know, they would have service these card readers in advance because in a do election, it was the same scenario. The card readers were not uh, really some card readers were really not functioning. I think they would have corrected uh, that in the case of Ondo State uh, election. Though we are aware that uh, uh, the store, uh, INEC lost about 5,000 card readers before, before the election. The store, they were kept, they were, there was fire and all that and all that. But that is not to say that uh, that should hamper the success of the 
election, but I think they would have done better by ensuring that uh, all those hitches that were experienced during the Edo State election, you know, they uh, are corrected. Uh, they should also remember is the election is not just a local activity. International communities are there, uh, observers are there, and they are trying to see what INEC will do to improve democratic uh, process in Nigeria. Uh, on those states, is only just a test case to see if Nigeria as a nation is prepared for uh, a fair, free, and uh, credible e election. I think they should have that in mind. Uh, because they do election, if we could still recall, the president was taking credit. Oh, you see, uh, election was free, fair, credible. Uh, we are living that era where going to have uh, Nigeria is going to experience problem in uh, electoral process. Nigeria is, uh, you know, trying to get up there like uh, other advanced democratic uh, nations. You know, so I think that uh, credibility ought to be sustained, you know, by INEC uh, because it's the eye of the, of the government, is the eye of the president. So I think when INEC has that in mind, they should uh, do everything to ensure that the image of the country in terms of democratic uh, process is uh, respected and uh, Nigeria is seen in the uh, Committee of Nations as a country that democratically uh, developed. Because it is, it is, it's not just election per se, you know. Uh, the issue is that when a nation seems to be democratically matured, you know, other countries will see such a uh, nation, you know, to be mature enough to do a lot of, uh, engage in a lot of uh, international uh, activities among nations. But if a nation is seen not to be mature democratically, it will also affect whatever, uh, you know, relationship is going to have with advanced democratic uh, nations. I think the Nigerian government should always have that in mind and ensure that elections in Nigeria are free, fair, and credible. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Christopher, I'd like to get your take on uh, the feedback so far. I mean, considering the fact that when we started out uh, this morning, there were reports that came in, uh, interface with what we have currently. I'm sure most of the polling centers, uh, elections will be at the conclusive stage. Elections are supposed to end at about 2.30 today. Yeah. It's very unfortunate that every time we try to advance and then hopes are raised that we are raising the bar sure. in processes and in things that we do you have incidental cases that you know put a pause to so these are our you know uh, expect, uh, expectations and hopes that make us want to begin to question whether we actually made any progress and i'm referring to the incident in akure the boys, the boy who gave the report said, these people are known. That's right. Mm. That they are the people that shut down somebody on the streets only about a week ago. I mean, he's not missing words. Yeah. Thugs, criminals, and murderers in every local community are known by the community people. You have 40,000 policemen eating and drinking, sleeping in hotels in Ondo State for the past how many days on federal government money. And there are known thugs who have been identified by the community before they came and were left loose until they still came in the day of election to shoot down somebody at close range. Mm. And then it's still at large. So we want to stress that we have to be more serious with dealing with election-related offenses. But I listened to Festus Kayamo and Dino Menai pre the presidential election in 2019. And Kayamo was able to make the point from a very strong legal argument that this kind of thing is not even election. Right? This is criminal. This is murder. This is criminal murder. He was saying it there that if you snatch ballot box, you should be shut down as the president had given directive. I was able to use the criminal law to explain that those who go to snatch ballot boxes are committing treason. It's not a matter of a coup. You are subverting and overthrowing the will of the people. Mm. And the people are the state, as far as democracy is concerned. concerned. So 
Not to talk of when you now go and shoot at point blank and, and we don't know what will happen to whoever they shot now in the hospital. So we should be more serious about dealing with issues like this. And I should think that the president should ask the IG, if you have 40,000 policemen in the state, as I said this morning, that is more policemen than you have in some African countries, entire country. And they cannot secure and prevent. They cannot prevent somebody or people bringing arms to a particular police unit. Let us assume that that is a bit difficult. Are they just there to parade uniforms? They are security men. They should also have, we, we understand that you are not supposed to carry guns to police units. But that is why you are security men. They should have intelligent ways of also having their own resistant force mm. that will not be in the full glare of the public. So that when you have incidences like this, they come it immediately. Yeah. If they come two or three like this in any election, Whoever is going to try this kind of thing in another election is going to think twice. Because you don't even know. You can't stop you from having plain clothed policemen. Identify plain clothed policemen around the environment. At the moment you have something like this, they are, they, are, they are not allowed to escape. They are apprehended immediately and brought down so that you discourage this kind of thing. It is not for you to wear uniforms and then a day to the election you drive around the whole time you call it show of force. It is not the force. It is the intelligence. The ability for the force to be effective when it is most needed. And one of the reasons why that is difficult is because these known thugs are being sponsored by known mm -hmm. politicians also in the environment who have compromised the security system around that environment. And that's why they can have the courage and the boldness to come to pulling units and begin to shoot down people. These are the kind of things we don't want to hear again in our you know, uh, uh, electoral process. And then you come to the issue of the boat, Ms. Hab, that we're talking about. Wooden boats <laughs> carrying <laughs> over 15 people. 21st century. Sometimes mm. it is. And you saw the water this morning. Yes. Mm. The state of the water, the undulating nature of the water. And did you, did you, did you listen when you read? He said, it was co-travelers, co-villagers who were traveling that were the rescue team that rescued this INEC official. Yes. They didn't tell you that there was a, a rescue team provided by government. Yes. In case on, of this kind of contingency, mm. they were on standby. In case of this kind of thing. He said it was rescue team from co-travelers who were traveling to the same direction. If you have been to River Rhine areas, sometimes they go four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, even 15 boats all on the sea that rescued these people. Because when they said this morning that none of them died, I was wondering, did they have standby sea divers around who were just waiting for the boat to capsize? Now I understand why. That it was co-travelers. So locals in a wooden boat Perhaps it's a canoe, they are even calling a boat. Because what we saw this morning looks this more or like one a, of a, those a, engine a, boats boat, that have yes, this uh, yes, at, at uh, generator engine at the back. <laughs> Carrying 15 people. We, we, in, I, I mean, for a federal government agency that enjoys such a huge budget, mm. and then these are plans you make over a period of time. And you sit down, you say, our team, our logistic team, our this one team, it's pretty finishing touches. We put all things in place. If we didn't have this, nobody will hear that they traveled on that kind of boat. I'm very sure that the budget, budget line that was submitted it's not, it's not for that uh, for deployment uh, management mm. did not include mm. a wooden boat mm. for for that kind of a journey. So I'm sure this has come up to the fore. And to tell me that you have to wait till tomorrow to make a statement. What are you waiting till tomorrow for? They took off from a particular point under a particular supervision, and then there is such a report. Why are we waiting till tomorrow before I next we make a statement? What are you investigating? So it means those people are just going on their own. So you have to wait until you, those people are resuscitated in the hospital and they begin to narrate to you all the things that happened before you can have a report to address the nation. And I hope that it is not going to be that that election mm. in that particular area will be postponed. I hope that it's not going to be the report. If it's going to be postponed, let it not be more than one or two days. Because it's not a, a large area, at least, at least from the report I've seen there. Mm. Uh, it is just one boat, you know. So I, I think these are the issues that are thrown up by this kind of uh, report. Fantastic. Thank yes. you very much, uh, Christopher Ojekere. Uh, really heartbreaking when you hear things like this. Uh, a wooden boat carrying 15 passengers. I mean, um, my, my greatest concern was the fact that uh, apart from the fact that it was a wooden boat, it was overloaded. Yes. And as a result, the boat capsized, exactly. uh, electro materials floating in the sea. But thank God, all the people who were there were rescued and uh, no life was lost. So we're hoping to hear what the um, ANEC National Chairman, ANEC Chairman 
would say uh, by the time they're ready with the report. But we just confirmed, uh, we just have this report now from uh, Vanga newspaper saying that uh, the shooting, yes, uh, shooting in Undo, police confirmed shootings at polling units, all right? So uh, that's on Vanga. It says there were sporadic shootings at polling unit 11, uh, Edo Lodge in uh, Okejebu, Akure, on Saturday. Uh, Ondo police spokesman Tili Ikoro confirmed the incident to newsmen in Akure. All right, uh, no casualty was recorded as at the time of filing this report, according to Vanguard. Uh, Tili Ikoro also confirmed that mobile police operatives have been deployed to the scene. So we keep our tabs on that and hope it comes out that way. Uh, in all ramifications. They're still talking about uh, possibility of violence or alleged violence. The Deputy Inspector General of Police in charge of Undo State Governorship Election, Mr. Leye Oyebade, has described as untrue the claims in the video that the wife of the State Governor, Betty Akedodulu, was attacked and injured at a polling unit in Owo. The DIG said this in an interview with our correspondent, that's the punch, uh, we're quoting the punch now. I said, we have checked and found out that the report is not true. That our incident is not true. The area is calm and there is nothing like that. And to corroborate the position of the DIG, the wife of Akere Dulu, Betsy Akere Dulu, uh, has debunked reports on social media that she was attacked by some hoodlums today while casting her vote. Mrs. Akere Dulu described the report as absurd and one orchestrated by desperate persons. When asked about the supposed attack, the governor's wife who spoke with reporters said, that's insane, that's absurd. That tells you how desperate people can be in our political landscape. Now, Prof, we are back to the era of fake news, fake story, <laughs> in an electoral process like we're having. Let me get your take on this. Well, I think uh, the mainstream media, it's more reliable and more dependable when it comes to issues of uh, situation reports on election. But when it comes to social media, it's a different ballgame entirely. We have a series of uh, fake news, particularly designed to serve some purposes or to create impression of what is not to the electorate. That look, take the Owo case for example. The incumbent governor is from the Owo Aziz. And of course, it is assumed that they will have sympathy for the governor. If the wife was attacked, it means that it is a party that is not of the governor's own platform that has attacked the wife. Now, you're creating some problems you know, in the mind of the indigenous of Ondo and the electorate to say, look, this party, look at what they are doing. What we are trying to avoid is a situation that happened in 1983, where you have uh, this kind of fake news, you know. Then it was, there was no social media. It was just rumor. They are stealing your, it was, they are stealing your vote in court. They are stealing your votes. They are stealing your votes. People said, who are stealing your votes? Mm. They said, blah, blah, I don't want to mention. They said this and that. And of course, there was eruption of violence. So the idea of fake news is to create problems of violence in that particular area. And I think this is where uh, Chris Jekere has talked about uh, sharing intelligence reports among the public security forces. You cannot mobilize 30,800 plus uh, policemen in addition to the already existing one, almost 40,000, without coordinating intelligence between the public security forces. We have the DSS. We have even the police units. They have the intelligence service. Even the civil defense, you also have the our intelligence unit. Are these people not on ground to share intelligence and to take appropriate action to follow up the intelligence and ensure that areas are protected, materials are protected, and those, those going to vote are protected, 
Island officials are protected. Don't have that, that responsibility. Take look, move from Owo, go to Akure, where there were shootings. They said this happened about a week ago, where some persons that they know and identify in the society mm -hmm. say, "Look, this is what we are going to do in case you deviate from our own position." Today, they carried out that same threat. It's okay. Let us go and try. Does it mean at the time they were shooting, road safety, they were running for safety, or that security <laughs> officer? <laughs> we're running for security, <laughs> very <laughs> defending. <laughs> <For safety, no? laughs> <laughs> or that's where running. Does it mean that they didn't work on intelligence reports? They didn't see what was happening to be able to prevent that kind of problem. So we're worried. I don't want to mention political parties. Mm -hmm. You know what happened in those states, particularly in Onyo, for example where some persons felt well, the only way they could achieve their result would be through violence. They simply explained itself out now in a current axis of uh, the capital. And how do you expect that 21st century, people are still thinking of violence, you know, destroying ballot papers, uh, the snatching ballot buses, as the only way by which you can prove that your candidate is the one that will win the election. So it is worrisome. Worrisome in the sense that uh, the election itself has its own cost. I'm not going into that. But the security implication of every election, if you mobilize, it's not just to have uh, policemen or security forces as sentry. You know, those who work as sentry, mm. they just stand. Their business is not you, their business is just to watch. Mm. They are not there, security forces don't go there as observers. Exactly. They're not observers. <laughs> Their security. Their security to maintain law and order and ensure that the lives of the people who are going to vote, they are protected. Yeah. So, are you going there with batons? I don't know whether they still have batons. Mm -hmm. Are you going there with, uh, with uh, shotguns? Are you going there with light weapons? What exactly are you going there with to protect the process? Because that's why I said in the beginning that the electoral process is very, very complex. It's not just about counting now at the end of today's uh, process, uh, process mm. but it's to ensure that everything is secured. The ballot paper is secured, the register is secured, the candidates are secured, the results are secured, the personnel they are secured. And so when you do all of this, what do you take into consideration? Logistics. Let me return back to what uh, Chris said about the boat that uh, had a mishap. Uh, in the seas, in the waters. The wooden boat. The wooden boat. Yes. In the 21st century, <laughs> 21st century Nigeria, is sad. You know why it is sad? It has to do with logistics of the election. You remember in Edo State, some vehicles that were conveying ethnic officials and materials broke down on the highway. <laughs> and so they had to look for some <laughs> other alternatives <laughs> to get to that destination. So INEC should now begin to think of the logistics of moving the men and the materials to their locations for election. You cannot say, look, we have given you the money, we have given you one higher vehicle. The way it is done is that every local government you know, has the responsibility to organize and ensure that the materials are safe within its local government. Mm -hmm. And so a local government that is riverine mm -hmm. in Delta also in Ondo, for example, even a do Delta, Ondo, all those different areas, including mm -hmm. Ondo. How do you want to conduct election with wooden, wooden boats <laughs> from the 21st century Nigeria? Are there no speed boats that they could deploy for such purposes, if nothing else, to secure the lives of those ANEC officials? They're human beings. We should not put their life at risk. In any case, look at what they were carrying 15 personnel including materials. Mm -hmm. How do you explain that kind of development? Thank you very much. Um, INEC uh, report or statement is finally out as it relates to the wooden boat uh, mishap mm -hmm. that uh, occurred yesterday. Uh, and let me read it to you. I'm sure you see that on the screen in a bit. Uh, it says Independent National Electoral Commission press release. INEC can confirm that there was an accident last night during the movement of personnel and materials to the Riverine registration areas of Ilaje local government 
of uh, Undo State for today's governorship election. Fortunately, all personnel and election materials were rescued when the boat, the wooden boat, capsized. That's for emphasis, you know that. Uh, this was made possible by officers and personnel of the Nigerian Navy who escorted <laughs> the boats. The movement was eventually concluded and voting commenced as planned in all the polling units today. INEC commends the resilience and professionalism of the Nigerian Navy as well as those of other personnel involved in the exercise signed by Ambassador Dr. Rufus Olorun Tony Akeju, Resident Electoral Commissioner on those no, states. No, uh, uh, sorry, yes. I want yes. to say something here. Yes. Are they saying that <laughs> the wooden canoe was escorted by naval personnel? Of course. That's what, that's what you heard me read. Where did they come from? I just from? read it. See, Where did they me. come from? See, we should not deceive ourselves in this country. <laughs> if you have the logistics to use naval ships, Never speed boats, <laughs> never personnel to escort materials. The same materials you put in a wooden boat, yes. a wooden canoe, mm. and they do not use, my God, something is happening in this. You see, let them not lie. Uh, that, this is the point we are trying to say in this country. Something has happened. They should accept their fault concerning the logistics of moving the materials to a larger area of Ondo and the mishap. It's a shame. It is a shame because um, it was avoidable. There are other so sure. structures and uh, platforms that could have been used to transport it's, it's, those it's, materials it's, to it's, the yes. destination. Yes, but, but, see, but uh, I, I yes. just think we have to be honest here. You see, <laughs> they know that the budget for the election was huge. Yeah, exactly. And in view of that, I don't think I don't think what they recommended there for logistics. A larger area, riverine area, was, was wooden boats. Okay, Prof, Prof, <laughs> yes, uh, that would be speculation because yes, yes, we yes, don't have no, access no. to the budget now. No, no, no. We, we no, can't no, tell no. what exactly was but, put but in I, there. No, I said we don't expect yes. that the logistics should be wooden boats. We yes. don't expect no, that. No, we don't expect it, but we yes. don't know exactly yes. what was put there yes. for the logistics. For example, yes. i give you a typical example. Okay. Even when you transport materials for elections mm. to... Mm. Uh, the interior places. Mm -hmm. Normally, they rely on vehicles provided by maybe transport units. Mm -hmm. One would expect that INEC would be able to deploy that vehicle. They do deploy that vehicle, but because of the nature of the job, mm -hmm. only their vehicles will not be enough to do the job of yes. transporting materials yes. to the designated uh, mm -hmm. voting areas. Yes. So we, we can't tell for sure what was in the budget for the transportation of these materials mm. to the river right areas. Mm. The involvement of the Navy uh, is based on the synergy that exists between INEC security mm. agents, whether police, army, air force, and stuff like that, mm. just to ensure that the election goes on smoothly. Yes. I just wanted to establish Sorry, that. Yeah. The, just yes. one question. Yes. Was it the Navy that rescued them, or the Navy sending report yes. that this is what it's, this, they should have done, yes. but it's unfortunate they couldn't do it? Mm. In a dual election, yes. Mm. We saw evidence of speed boats. Yes. That we exactly. acquired for the purposes yes, of yes, moving yes, men and yes, materials yes, to the different areas yes, of Ondo, yes. Ikbobaoka, and yes. Obia Southwest. Yes. Yes. We saw that. So yes. it's possible Why? wooden boats were provided for the transportation <laughs> oh my God. of materials <laughs> to the river and areas. It's very possible. Now, you know what is it's, funny? You know yeah. what's funny, sir? Yeah. Now, for Navy to rescue them, <laughs> as, as Prof. the Navy would have been on. On ground. on ground. No, they said the because, Navy I mean, you don't, were you don't escorting spend, them. They yes. were escorting them. So the Navy were traveling on wooden boats mm -hmm. to escort a, another wooden boat. Or what? The Navy. Navy. Was another wooden boat. <laughs> and then, did you, did you reach for that? He said they continued the journey. Mm -hmm. Yes. After rescue. Yes. yes. And then the election went. Yes. Place. So that means they got to the destination. They got to the destination. But I thought we saw on top of the water Materials. With damaged material. Yes. So there was a spare material being carried along. Well, that's that's. No, no, it's very but curious I, we I, ask this it's, question it's, because it's good we ask because, this question. Yeah, because but most importantly, if, if if the material sank in the water, yeah, was there a duplicate set of material being carried along? Were they plastic? Where were they? Were they plastic materials? It, it's or possible, you mean it's that they quickly they got back? Floating on water they quickly, doesn't mean they were destroyed. Floating on water doesn't mean they were destroyed. We know because the, weather, the statement added that 
uh, personnel and materials were rescued, that they were rescued, and mm. then they continued with the journey until they got to that destination. And that voting commenced this morning in those yeah, and, 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 they, and they said they are in neck officials, according yeah. to the first report, that they are in the hospital. True or false? According to the first report, were they not, were they were, not discharged? Were, were those first were reports, discharged? I just read, I just read mm. yeah. um, the <laughs> press release by INEC signed by the mm. Resident Electoral Commission. Yeah. We don't have that. Yeah. Yeah. Our citizens, so, we are asking questions. Yes. Yes. Because the proactiveness between when that vote mishap happened mm. yes. and when we were able to rescue material, provide mm. new one, mm. uh, rescue our neck officials that were in the hospital, mm. Navy suddenly mm. appearing on the scene. No, the scene. It's, it's, it's the speed of, I don't think America will be able to achieve that kind of speed. It's almost in the credit that in meeting with the a contingency. In spite of the mishap, <laughs> still <laughs> went yeah. on in the I think what happened is that from my own assessment, it's possible it happened last night, is it not? Yes. Mm -hmm. huh? So based on the reports that this was what happened last night, yes. early this morning, they, they, would, the have moved, they, they would have brought in the proper they would have boats re and moved the they would have material. redeployed mm -hmm. other men and materials yeah. Yeah. to now move. Exactly. Yeah, other using men and the, yes. using yes. the, yes. the proper yes. team. The proper <laughs> team to, <laughs> to do. I'm sure that's what, yes, that was that's what happened. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. On that basis, they are sending yes. us this new report. Yes. Okay. Yes. So let's, let's take a look at uh, uh, another very interesting thing that has come forth in this election so far. Uh, the candidate of the PDP, Itai Degede, uh, you can see him on the screen now, casting his vote. But there was an undercurrent in his casting of his vote, which has to do with the fact that uh, uh, he accused INEC of creating a problem, according to the punch. He, however, said despite the hitches, I mean, uh, he showed um, uh, an I mean, a favorable outcome in the election. But before he eventually voted, smart card reader could not read his card. Mm -hmm. And he was asked to step aside for others to other voters to vote. Smart card reader could not also read PVC of Eno, Jagede's wife, but mm -hmm. his daughter voted without any hitch. Mm -hmm. The machine had worked perfectly until when Jagede and, and the wife were to cast their votes. After about 10 minutes, Jagede and his wife voted at about 11 a.m. after the machine was rectified. Speaking to newsmen after voting, Jagede accused INEC of creating a problem, saying the commission should be asked why the card reader stopped functioning when it was his turn to cast his vote. He said, INEC is creating a problem. The machine stopped working when it was my turn to vote. I had to protest, and they said the machine was rectified. But despite all these hitches, there has not been major disruption. But I don't know what is happening in remote areas. The turnout has been massive. Voters conducted themselves well. I'm aware that there is a pocket of violence in Ijomu area. I also heard of an incident of vote buying. Oh, coming, we're coming to that uh, particular point. Now, uh, this is quite demoralizing. Mm. I mean, as a candidate in an election, and then you go to a polling unit to cast your vote, uh, the card reader works up until when you bring your card reader. Mm. Not only you, you and your wife. So what could have happened to the card reader suddenly to now deny me voting? I think that's what played out here. But yes. we also recognize that the card readers, they are not human beings, they are machines. Mm. Even yeah. if they were human beings, yeah. they could also break down it my could, function. It could be a coincidence. The problem yes. is, yeah. is technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The technology that is designed mm -hmm. to capture data from your voter's card. Mm -hmm. So if that technology has a problem, it can be fixed. Yeah. But in this case, who owns the technology? Not Nigeria. Yeah. We don't have access to that technology. We are only using the, the, the technology to demonstrate that as far as elections are concerned, we can make it more credible, more transparent, free and fair, by ensuring that whosoever is coming to use a particular uh, uh, vote, a permanent voter's card is the owner of that card. That's all. And then, of course, you know the idea of thumb printing, which all, again indicates that the owner of the card read, of, 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 the, of the PVC is already authenticated through the thumb print, and therefore you cannot vote. It's legitimate to cast your vote. But supposing it is X way, if not for the candidate, what would have happened? So that's where maybe Professor Jewede want to say something about that.
Yeah. It is, he is a candidate, mm -hmm. himself and his wife. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say it's a spiritual problem. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> 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 you talk about his wife, mm -hmm. you know, and then all of a sudden he stopped functioning. Mm -hmm. uh, there could be some arrows mm -hmm. or a report mm -hmm. from somewhere, mm -hmm. but those arrows were deflected. Okay. We are still voted. Right. Because one, one thing about the election is this, mm -hmm. that you are able to vote as a candidate has its own spiritual implications. It means you have done what you have to do, many others will have followed you. Mm -hmm. If you're not able to vote, to be difficult in an election, or you, you couldn't vote. In any case, it's, it's not his problem. But we're happy that he was able to vote. Uh, you yeah. see, we must also, you know, look at um, uh, a tile Jagede and his own concept of election in Ondo State. Okay, oh. now, Prof, Prof, before you um, yes. express it on, on that, we'll just take a quick break. We'll be back to talk more on Ondo 2020 governorship election. There's also the EFCC dimension to the election. I'm sure you want to know all of these when we return. Don't go away. Thanks again for staying with us on the ITV Radio Live Studios on Undo 2020 governorship election. Let me say a big thanks to our panelists for this segment of our conversation. Christopher Jekyll, thank you for coming. Thank you, sir. Professor Tony Jewell, we appreciate it's you. Professor Benson Nusdalo, thank you for staying with us. Thank okay, you. let's keep tabs with Al Hassan Bala, who, reported, uh, who reports that there is heavy presence of security personnel at the Cathedral Primary School polling unit in Akura South, where the PDP candidate voted as voting ends, and electorates await sorting and counting. Uh, we talked about this earlier in the day. Uh, we said we expected the electorate to actually match words with action uh, after voting, wait for the sorting and the counting. But we've also been told now there is heavy security presence. This is a very, very critical stage of the electoral process, Chris. Yes, because all the exercise that had gone on since morning would amount to nothing if at this point, you know, when Christ went to the garden of Gethsemane with his disciples, as at the time they were coming to pick Christ, that was when the disciples were sleeping. After he had prayed, he came back and he met them sleep and he said, you could not watch for everyone now. Watch and pray so that you don't fall into temptation. What happened a few minutes later? One of them was cutting off the ears of uh, the, the servant of the high priest because he wasn't praying. So he didn't know that what he needed there were spiritual weapons and not physical weapons. If at this point you have allowed the exhaustion of standing as pulling agents and watching over the voting exercise and process, if at this point you now get exhausted and you take a nap, the result you might see beyond this point you might never be able to explain it again, and your candidate will just have lost. So this is the point of vigilance. Because right now, in the polling unit, thank God for the new deployment management that INEC has introduced. Whatever is counted now, and you agree to it, is transmitted straight to INEC portal. And whatever has gone to that INEC portal, contesting it is going to be very difficult. So this is the time the form EC8 you are going to train your eyes on it as an agent and ensure that whatever you agree to is a true reflection of what was there. And the moment all agents have agreed and appended their signature within the unit, it is transmitted straight to the portal. It remains there. Beyond there, they will now escort the results to the collation center. So the reason why you see heavy security presence around Jagadeth's place, and I'm sure it's a similar thing in every other place, is because this is when arguments, you know, and counter yes, arguments, and counter arguments as they start to count, you know, so that everybody would be kept in check. That is why you have police presence around, especially major contenders for the election, so that as soon as the results are announced and everybody agrees, it's transmitted. That's the state they are in. It's very critical. Yes, Prof. Yes, uh, yeah. I think. Um, in addition to what he has said, on those state, in the history of Nigeria, 
from 1960 to the present day is a hot spot of electoral violence. Go and check. Beyond what happened in the Badon in the 60s, probably Badon is spread to Hondo in the 60s. Now, in the Second Republic, a similar thing happened. Now, this is Third Republic. So, this is Fourth Republic. In the Third Republic, of course, we didn't witness such things. But, of course, there was this clash between the two main parties at that time, the Democrats and the Republicans. Now, this is Fourth Republic. This is not the beginning of the Fourth Republic. This is uh, almost 20 years after the inauguration of the Fourth Republic. We are witnessing this kind of a thing simply because that area is hot spot of violence, or they may call it hot bed of electoral violence. violence. Okay. Now, the truth is, all that has happened in terms of preparation for the election, that the conduct of the election at this moment of counting, very, very critical. Critical in the sense that the materials have to be protected. If you sort and you count without security agencies, there may be some talks, hoodlums, that may attack the officials in that particular process. Mm -hmm. That is why you see heavy presence of security personnel at this point in time. But I hope it is reflected not only in a particular unit of a candidate, but virtually all the units where counting is taking place. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, in as much as the materials have been moved from the unit to the ward, and from the ward, of course, it goes to the local government, uh, we must also ensure that whatever has been transmitted to the annex portal is a true reflection of what they have observed at the point of counting. Someone is going to transmit it. And what is on paper could be transmitted wrongly. Mm -hmm. So if annex says what they have in their portal is final, but has been transmitted wrongly because of the result that does not reflect what happened on paper, how do we resolve that particular problem? Well, I think that's <laughs> where the agents Okay. The, the, the party agents now. Party agents will come in because, uh, like what happened in the case of uh, those states, yes. they had their own situation room. The, oh, no, only the, PDP. Yeah, PDP. I'm talking about PDP. Yeah, PDP. 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 Yes, PDP. PDP didn't have it. No, the APC did not. But yeah. as a result, we have been transmitted to our next portal. They were similar things. So at the end of the exercise, uh, I think PDP have to compare results. And they were, they were very, very similar. That's right. With very small uh, 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 difference. And uh, so I, I, I think uh, PDP here, you know, as a party would have adopted the same thing, you know, you know create a situation room. As a uh, result, this entry and neck uh, portal, the same thing should be happening to uh, that of PDP. So, you see, the whole idea is not just a party per se is to also make the INEC job easier, you know, because if uh, a party decide to do similar thing and the, the result at the end of the day are similar, you know, it's kudos to INEC because it shows they have done, they have done a very good job. And, 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 and so I, I think it should be re, uh, replicated by, you know, the same party and not just PDP, other parties, you know, because the essence of, uh, free, fair, and credible election is a national interest. It's not just a party interest, you know, because when it's like assisting INEC to build a credible uh, uh, result, you know, presentation, and it's for the good of everybody, for the advancement of uh, democracy in Nigeria. So I think it's something that, that should be. And um, one thing we have noticed over the years is uh, during voting, uh, accreditation, election, they would say, oh, everything's going on smoothly. But at that point of collation, that is when the trouble starts. So that's why it was very interesting to watch from the clip how security have moved in. It means ANEC have learned some lessons and is now working in synergy with uh, security agents to ensure that the election is truly uh, free, fair, and, and credible. And this portal thing they introduced, I think, is a wonderful idea. Fantastic. Well, but our studio time is uh, 2.40 p.m. That means uh, voting should have ended by now and uh, counting of uh, the votes in progress. We heard that a while ago uh, in one of the 
unit that Alassane Bala is monitoring on the Odo State governorship election. But you know, as is always the case, only the umpire itself, Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, that has the constitutional authority to announce the results. Yes, the results will be declared at each of the units where the election took place, and then, of course, move to the coalition center. <coughs> Eventually, the resident electoral commissioner uh, or whoever is the chief coalition officer for the state will make that announcement. And so a few days ago, that became a major talking point with the PDP candidate alleging that a certain vice chancellor who okay. is an indigenous of the state, perhaps also loyal to the incumbent governor. governor, has been made the returning officer for the election. That created a whole lot of attention you know, in the I, state. I think yeah. uh, it, yeah. it's the vice chancellor of Obama University. Yes. 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 yes, 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 yes. And like I said, no, they're not going to use him. Yes, that they already have information about his background. Okay, and, and they will use somebody else. Yes, the same thing happened in Edo State. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm aware in Edo State, for example, that the returning officers they used came from outside of Edo State. Yes, yes, because of the petition that some person they wanted to use for a dual state may be sympathetic to a particular political party okay. and candidate. Okay. And for that reason, there was this INEC decision to say, okay, we'll stop it so. Let us do it this way. And they did it that way and everything was okay. I'm sure the same thing INEC, yes, INEC is going to do in the uh, Undo State. All right, uh, Chris, you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, it's the same thing because okay. INEC put their feet down to mm -hmm. say, they alone can appoint who is going to be returning officer, not party. Okay. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, so. All right, let's, let's take a look at uh, uh, some of the story that uh, was up earlier today, uh, where heavy rainfall actually disrupted voting process and also destroyed even polling booths. Um, that story is on uh, Vanguard newspaper. Yeah, Vanguard newspaper carried that story this morning. Uh, heavy rainfall has disrupted. Uh, the ongoing election process in the Jebu area of our local government area of Undo State. Uh, according to NAN, uh, the heavy rain destroyed some election materials with the voting booths in some polling centers thoroughly soaked, while staff of uh, INEC uh, took refuge and struggled to secure the materials. The voters also scampered to various directions to take shelter from the rain. Uh, NAN reports that the voting later commenced with security personnel keeping vigil at all polling units around the area. At polling units 002 in Ward 5 in Jebuo area, NAN observed that voters wore their face masks while INEX staff also made hand sanitizers and soap available for use. Speaking with newsmen, Okbayami Amadu, presiding officer in Jebu 2 unit 006 Ward 5 said, the accreditation and voting would go on simultaneously. Well, the rain came very, very heavy, but it wasn't enough to deter people. Uh, the lady in question also explained that the use of face masks was compulsory why uh, any voter showing symptoms of COVID-19, like incessant coughing, would be politely asked to leave the queue. But Mio has also said that uh, brown face masks were prohibited, declared the voting open by 8.35 AM. Now reports that voters were checked with a thermometer and given hand sanitizers while social distancing was observed. Now, uh, naturally, in the rains, the electoral process would have been disrupted. But thank God the people understood what's at stake and they stood their grounds to ensure that they cast their votes. I mean, it's rain, mm -hmm. people scamp scampered for safety, all right? But what about those who actually fell in their water? <laughs> <laughs> Those who <laughs> fell inside water, I mean, they didn't have yeah. a choice. That's the way life is. But Chris, I'd like to get a take on this. The, uh, the rates uh, uh, came down in some part of uh, on those we, we, we cannot, we cannot, because we, are, we, we cannot see from here mm. the particular location. Yes. But when I hear things like rain destroying sensitive voters' materials mm -hmm. or election materials, yeah. election materials, are they so bulky? Mm -hmm. I mean, was it a hamlet? There was no building at all where we could have kept those materials. And then it, it does appear like the, they were already queued up before the rain because they say voters camp out for safety. So it would appear that voting probably had started before the rain. I, I said the rain started so suddenly. If the rain had given signs 
there could be, you see, this is where INEC need to train the officials to take charge and take responsibilities of their pooling units. If the rain was giving warnings and somebody are taking responsibilities and explain to the voters and quickly reach an agreement, the first thing we should do is to secure this material That's right. so that we don't have the materials destroyed by rain. Everybody is seeing the rain. Okay, so that would have been done. People can get wet and all of that, but the materials, I think materials are too sensitive to be subjected to all these kind of vagaries as we've been hearing them since. And then the people that were separated from the line that showed symptoms of cough or whatever, you have no way of testing their death if it's COVID-19, but where those are part of the symptoms, were they allowed to vote? Or were they politely asked to no, leave they, the they line not, it, wasn't like, the, it wasn't like there were people who were coughing. Exactly. Yes. It was just a general overview mm. of the guidelines mm. that yes. those who are found to be coughing and all of that okay. would be isolated. Okay. Not like there were people who... I thought it was a report. No, it was, it was a report. Yeah. Yeah. It was exactly. a report. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, the rain, I mean, the lawyers today use the word lawyers use. It's, it's force majeure. Nobody planned for it. Mm. But if it is coming and is giving signs, proactive measures should be taken. Okay. INEC materials must always be secured and safeguarded at all times. Because you could even have, well, thank God, where there are manipulative processes. The moment the things are no longer intact, the way it was given, and they, it, it can create room for manipulation because they will always be replaced. And when they are replaced, they could be replaced by <laughs> other materials, other that from uh, the ones INEC had given. Yeah. So that's top priority, securing INEC materials. And I think with the presence of security agents, uh -huh. you know, uh, most of the police uh, uh, units uh, where election, you know, have been taking place is is mainly in a building, either in a school, primary school, also. primary school, or secondary school, or where they always need. So yes. they could have equally taken the materials to be secured in the building, you know, and ask security people to be with them, them. as a, a, a kind of protection. So the idea of saying materials were destroyed, you know, should not, uh, should not raise, raise its ugly head at all because there was just no need for it in view of the fact that uh, there's opportunity to secure the, the, the materials in the buildings where election is being conducted. So I, I, I don't just understand. So I, uh, I think here, uh, Professor Jaworey and Chris, they've spoken about it. But you see, the organization and operation of an election does not take place in an open space. It takes place in a particular beauty. Yes. And once the rain gives some kind of signs, warning, that it's coming down heavily, it doesn't just come blah, blah, like that. The first to do is to secure the materials. Okay. And appeal to the electorates that, look, look at what is happening. We want to protect the materials first. Mm -hmm. Thereafter, let us see what happens so we can then continue with the process. Okay. But it must be solution. <laughs> yes. That it rains have come. What do you do when the rain has come? Election is over, that's what I'm saying this. Yeah. Uh, if, if it's raining and you know that something else cannot cover you except another thing. So it's a reminder that this is where you're supposed to go to. Exactly. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> now, now, gentlemen, um, uh, in the Edo State governorship election, I think we saw uh, a, we female, a female governorship candidate. Uh, in the Edo State governorship election, what are those who eventually came together and endorsed? or the, amongst the 17 candidates that have their political party logos on the ballot paper, not even a single woman. And what does this mean for our democracy in terms of women participation, which is something that people have talked about over and over and over again. Chris? First of all, um, we, we must understand that it's a patriarchal society. And then the context within our climb is still not flexible enough to allow it to remain mainly and purely an intellectual contest. There's still a lot of physicality in our politics. And then there's still a lot of money politics. If you consider these factors, they are not favorable to women competing. There is also the question of family cultural reasons. Many husbands won't want their wives out there because the reputation of our policies have not improved. The integrity of our policies have not improved. 
And then the women who are participating in politics in Nigeria, as we have them today, their reputation are not helping and encouraging why husbands will allow their wives who are decent to participate. Mm. I say that because I play in the politics. Women who are participating today in the politics, almost all of them have histories that are not, you know, uh, that are not that are not very credible, and are not histories that many husbands will want their wives to also have. It is there that they were married before they went into politics and halfway they are divorced, or they are divorced, they go into politics and then they are accused of sleeping with this and sleeping with that and sleeping with that, or they are, you know, I mean, we, we went out for a particular rally and a huge woman, nobody would think of it, was almost fighting naked. So it is not, it, the environment has not been made gentle enough to allow decent women, to allow women that have abilities and capacities and competence to participate in so that we can begin to discover their metal and then allow and then queue behind them. So it's, real, it's still physical, the integrity is still compromised. And that's why you find that women will tell you, many women are not even interested at all in politics. They say, ah, no, 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 I, I can't go into that. Because the, the, the perception is that either you are entering into a very corrupt zone or a zone where money will need to be spent or in nowhere, a zone where people lie a lot or where you know, even results are skewed and all of that. So if we want women participation, we have to allow a system where fairness, equity, justice are allowed to play and then decency is allowed to rule so that wives who have found that their husbands who have found that their wives have potentials to be able to show this kind of competence can even encourage them and say, go and participate, I think you can win in this kind of environment. So that's why you find women participation is still very limited in our politics. Okay, and we're just on the verge of uh, concluding uh, our coverage today through a live studio on the UNDO 2020. Uh, but let me get uh, Professor Benson of the Lost take on women participation, as it were, which, of course, is non-existent in this UNDO state governorship election. Well, women in politics, particularly in Nigeria, has been something of contention for several reasons. Number one, politics is about investment. And um, those investors who want to put their resources in politics, have they been able to identify the women they want to support in politics? You see, it's not just enough to say, look, you are a woman, you want to go and context. You must have the credentials. You must have the ability. You must have the drive. You must have a vision. You must have the wisdom. You must be able to convince that investor in politics that you are capable of delivering. And in which case, they must identify you and recommend you. Okay. So how many of such women do we have today in Nigeria? The very few that we have are those on uh, appointive positions. OK, because of uh, gender balance. We want to have some men and women appointed into this position. But the fact that the woman has been appointed a commissioner or a minister or chairman of a board is not sufficient to prove that that woman has the capability to lead in politics. There are several cases where you have seen women, you know, run NGOs, you know, with strong power, with strong force. But that's an NGO. When you go into politics, the story changes. Two, discipline. Uh, the Nigerian political terrain is all about indiscipline. Uh, our men, our people are not so disciplined. In fact, uh, they harass people's wives, harass uh, daughters of children, you know, all kinds of things. Men are fond of it. Mm. And so when uh, some women look at the kind of harassment they are likely going to face in politics, mm. they may have the real power to go into politics, but they look at the kind of harassment that's okay. What am I going to do? Let me be a point of discouragement. Uh, exactly. All right, uh, Prof. What's your final take on this? Yes. Uh, you see, like uh, my friend was saying, that uh, maybe women are not given opportunity. I think parties have come to realize that uh, women' interests have to be taken care of in uh, politics, and in view of that, nomination forms they normally reduce 
the price drastically for women to take, pick up our nomination forms. And the whole idea is to encourage women. You know, like uh, some of the reasons my colleagues have uh, advanced. Uh, do you expect a woman, because on party meetings, uh, it's around 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m. at night. Are you now saying that somebody's wife will be staying out at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., say he's having a meeting? That, that's a factor. Then, of course, when you talk about democracy, money is involved, financial muzzle, yeah. you must have it. And uh, we are not saying some women have not done very well in business or in government to have financial muzzle, but, you know, uh, are they ready to spend it for, for politics like the men? then uh, it's not just the person now spending the money, the candidate. You ought to also receive donations from friends, family members, party faithful, and all that, and all that. And uh, so is she willing to do that? And in the process of doing that, the man has to be sure, because they're an investor. Hmm. The man who is sponsoring is an investor. He has to be sure that he's going to get dividends from his investment. And uh, therefore, can this woman... Uh, you know, can, can she win the election and all that and all that. So, uh, and I think women themselves, um, uh, women voters themselves are also not happy matters. Okay. Because the research has shown that the average woman will not, is, not like, is most likely not to vote for a fellow woman. Uh, and that is not helping matters. Okay. Either I think they have to do, be a lot, do a lot of political uh, enlightenment. Education and enlightenment. Yeah. All right, yeah. thank you, thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> uh, we want to say big thanks to everyone that made this special broadcast on the coverage of Undo State Governorship election a huge success. Uh, big thanks to our crew still in Undo State. But later today at 7:30, stay with us on the ITV Main News, and then at six o'clock. Stay with us on the Heartbeat News on Independent Radio to get update on the conduct of Undo State Governorship Election 2020. Uh, tomorrow by 10 o'clock, uh, Undo State Live Studio will be open again for us to uh, keep you up to speed with the election. Well, we hope that just like in Undo State, within 24 hours, INEC will be able to announce the outcome of exactly. the election today. We saw that happen in the Undo State election. We hope that can also happen in uh, Undo State. Someone sent me a message that I want to read uh, as a way of contribution to the conversation. Uh, this is uh, Sonny Edusa. You said, good afternoon, good afternoon. Uh, you said, I have said and told you before that Edo State September election is not and can never be a good example. It's just that people prefer to follow the crowd. Excuse me. Edo election was what I called collaboration between the people, personal hatred and pity. Mm. Nigerians are going to continue like this. Nigeria is going to continue like this for a very long time. If you listen to Barrister A.P. Thomas' submission on making political office unattractive, until that is done, desperation will continue, Sonny. Thank you, Sonny, for your contribution uh, to our conversation. But it's not for debate, Chris. It's no, not for a debate. I, it's, not, it's not for but a the debate. But the man should respect the, the <laughs> choice of people. It's, it's, it's not for a debate. That's just, the whole concept of democracy. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> just, that's just a contribution. I want to say a big thanks to uh, Christopher Jekere. Thank you. And thank Professor you, Tony Jekere. Thank it's you. It's a pleasure. For business, and thank you for it. But we'll be here tomorrow by 10 o'clock. We'll continue this discussion. You know we're partners uh, in the Edo State Governorship election. Yes. And we'll continue with that partnership in the Edo State Governorship election just to ensure that you are well informed and updated as the events progress. We want to say big thanks to all our crew members for making this broadcast a huge success. On behalf of Philip Omo Gupman, my name is Sonny Duke Okosun. Thank you for staying with us. Good afternoon. <laughs>